Tonight is Young Adult Health Night, so if you're not familiar with that, uh, that's been the theme for this year, is that we're speaking specifically on young adult health. Now what's interesting, if you just said, um, hey, is someone healthy? We'd immediately think of one or two things, right? We'd be like, well, do they have some sort of medical illness, or do they live an unhealthy lifestyle, right? We, so we'd think of physical health, and yet this is the uh, 10th message. We got two more young adult health messages, and it's the first time I'm going to speak on physical health. And, uh, and I think it's interesting because um, I, I honestly don't know if I've ever heard a sermon in church on physical health. Um, just kind of a very practical uh, side of living as a Christian. I am a believer that Christians ought to be the picture of health. And now when I say that, that can immediately uh, maybe offend someone. And, and I don't mean that I think they should all look like the statue of David, right? The, that great sculpted thing. What I mean is we ought to have healthy, balanced lives. What I mean is um, we ought to have temperance and um, we ought to have chastening and we ought to have um, discipline and things like that in our life. And, and not those things out of drudgery or like just burden and things, but out of a desire to be holy. And so we're going to speak on that tonight. But um, this, this idea about physical health and what does the Bible say about my body um, and your body um, to me, it can be very touchy. And so I'm going to talk about kind of two extremes. So I got Jacob, he's going to put a picture on screen for me. All right, look at that. Can y'all pick out which one's me? Which one? Yes. So that's me. I have a sweet bowl cut. Those were, that was the, that was the last time in my life I was trendy, by the way. Um, so I had a sweet bowl cut. Uh, the guy to the left, that's my buddy Adam, who sometimes I talk about, uh, my friend who was a Navy SEAL who uh, was killed in Afghanistan, that's him. And so we're there at a three-on-three tournament, uh, wearing my awesome kind of Chicago Bulls wannabe uniform. But um, I was kind of, I don't know, as a kid before I hit my growth spurt, that I was a little bit chubby. And uh, this is probably not even uh, the chubbiest I was, but um, I know this from a personal experience that um, even people you consider friends can be kind of mean. So it was very common for me as a kid to be called fat boy. Like, I'm, <laughs> thank you, Madison. I'm not saying that to, to get sympathy. I'm saying that tonight to say there's two extremes that we could go when we talk about physical health. And the one is we could say that um, either, either body shaming where people have done that, like we could, we could go to that extreme where we say that is um, not acceptable. Of course it's not. Um, but some people have done that. And so we could overreact and say because people have done that, made fun, they've called someone fat boy, something like that, then we could go to the other side where we say that physical health doesn't matter. Which, of course, that's not true, right? It, it's not a true thing to say that. It is, of course, wrong. And I say that as someone who seriously until, um, until I guess it was my first, my eighth grade year, my eighth grade year, I grew like six inches, and God just like went like this to me. And so I'm, I'm literally half an inch taller than I was in eighth grade, just so you know that. And so let's go ahead and show the next picture. So there's me and Danielle. So you all don't know this. Uh, I may have said this before, but like her dad asked me to train her at basketball. And I'm just saying, guys, that is a bad idea if you want to like have a lady still like you. Like I think she loved me already, but she stopped liking me sometimes because I was apparently a mean coach. But um, there we are, and so God kind of like stretched me out. And so over like a period of less than 12 months, I went from being called fat boy to then all of a sudden, opinions started to be you're too skinny. Like people, I don't know why people come up to me and say it's like I care what you think about how fit I am, but. But they do. And so people would come up to me, they'd be like, man, you're a little too skinny, Obi. Like, oh, well, thank you for telling me that thing that I didn't ask. But, but continually. And to be honest with you, I didn't change much of my life. You, you saw two pictures of me playing basketball. I was in a town of 700 people. There was nothing else to do. Like, we played basketball all the time, and I was still chubby. And then I, I got stretched out, and I did the same thing. And, and I felt pretty healthy as a human, but they're like, now you're too skinny. So we could take that extreme where people make fun of you, whether you're, you're too chubby, too skinny, or somewhere in between. And you can go to the other side and just say, well, we can't. We can't even focus on our body it, because it's like if you're even paying attention to how someone or even how yourself, 
how you're, you're fit, then that's the same as shaming. And of course, I, I'm someone who would say, yeah, never make fun of someone. Like that can do some deep psychological things to a person and it's just rude. Don't be a jerk, right? But the opposite side is true too. Those are two extremes. The mocking someone is an extreme and the pretending that physical health isn't a real thing is an extreme. Physical health is a real thing. So I've got some uh, statistics for you. This is from the CDC. So this says, people who have overweight or obesity compared to those with healthy weight are at an increased risk for many serious diseases and health conditions. You hear that? People who are overweight or obese are at an increased risk for many serious diseases and health conditions. Now you may say, well, yeah, obviously. These include, I like, this is interesting how they start this list, all causes of death. In parentheses, mortality. Like in case you didn't get it, all causes of death. What I mean by that is mortality. The fact that humans are mortal, like it's worse for you if you're a little overweight. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, low cholesterol, two ty uh, type two diabetes, coronary heart disease, stroke, gallbladder disease, osteoarthritis, sleep apnea and breathing problems, many types of cancer, low quality of life, here's one, mental illness, such as clinical depression, anxiety, and other mental disorders, body pain, and difficulty with physical functioning. So I just listed some of those from the CDC that says we're at an increased risk of all those. Now, if we picked out another sin, and, and I try to be a, a sincere preacher, other preachers have gifts I don't have. I try to be sincere. I just want to be real with you. This is the sin I struggle with the most. I grew up, y'all saw me playing basketball. I played basketball all the time. I'm not kidding when I say in a town of 742 at the time, I think there's like 40 less now, but it was 742 at the time. There was nothing else to do. And it's not like towns around here, how they kind of like, you have a town and then like, where does your town stop and the other ones start? It's not like that. It's like, no, you know there's a town and then there's like miles of cornfields before there's another town. Like there was nothing to do. So we played basketball all the time. I remember like during the winter, it would snow and because it's the Midwest, the snow would melt and, but not all of it. And so it'd be like 70 degrees in December, but snow on the ground. And I'd be like, well, it's warm enough to go play basketball. So we go like, what else are we gonna do? So I played sports all the time. I, uh, I played baseball, so our team, or our, our school, because we're so small, we didn't have a football team, uh, so we paid, played two baseball seasons. So I went from first baseball season to basketball season to second baseball season, and then I hated track because I hated to run for no reason, but our track coach would like come scout out our uh, basketball practice, and he'd be like, hey, I want you to join the team. And so he would like, talk us into it, and, and because there's nothing else to do, we would go do it. And so um, I ended up playing four sports throughout the school year, and then I ate like an athlete, right? So then a day comes when you stop being an athlete, and you still want to eat like an athlete. So here's the thing I'm saying to you. As I preach through this tonight, I do just want to be real with you, because I confess this as the thing I struggle with the most. I've already confessed my love for burritos from here many a time, and I don't plan to stop telling you that because they're fantastic, and if there's a burrito hater out there, I'll try to convert you. Not as hard as I want to convert you to Christianity, but, but it's the second place, all right? So I confess that to you while knowing that something like all causes of death are increased because of obesity and overweightness. Here's another one. CDC statistics on heart disease. Heart disease is the leading cause of death for men, women, and people of most racial and ethnic groups in the United States. They tried to make that a pretty inclusive, uh, well-rounded definition, did they not? You hear that again. It is the leading cause of death for men, women, and people of most racial and ethnic groups in the United States. One person dies every 34 seconds in the United States from cardiovascular disease. About 697,000 people in the United States died from heart disease in 2020. That is one in every five deaths. It's significant. Like, don't shame anyone for how they appear because 
Um, this, is, this has kind of changed my view on sin, honestly. Just having this struggle that I call it the sin we don't talk about, which that is what gluttony and sloth are. They're the sin we don't talk about. But it's changed my mindset because um, Christians are so quick to pick at some other sins, and yet we don't pick on ones that maybe we don't find as terrible. And maybe what that should teach us is let's quit picking at people's sin and start discipling and, and growing them up in Christ and realizing that we all have struggles and we all have vulnerabilities. And the goal is not to just beat someone down, embarrass, condemn those things. That's not the goal. That's not Christianity. The, the goal of Christianity is to get someone to understand their position before a holy God as a sinner, whether that be because of gluttony and sloth or, or because you have a sexual sin or a, a drug problem or your problem is you have a temper or you're very um, jealous of other people. I don't, I don't know what your struggle is. I'm just saying you have one at least and you probably have more than one, uh, but, but we all have those. And that doesn't mean you don't know Jesus just because you have a struggle with something. What it means is, because you follow Jesus, my goal is not just to to pretend. Like, like I have to be perfect to show up at church. I have to, to act a certain way, look a certain way, otherwise I won't be received in church. And we forget that the purpose of Christianity is to save us from our sins, to reconcile us to a holy God. And so, so that's not to say, therefore, go do whatever you want. It's to say, recognize that you are a sinner and the path of a Christian is to grow in Christ-likeness. That means if your sin is pornography, then, then you ought to work for the rest of your life at chastening yourself from lust. And if your sin is gluttony and sloth, you ought to work the rest of your life at chastening yourself from those things. And so we ought not pick at someone for this. What we ought to do is partner with them in discipleship. So it's a different perspective. But maybe you go the other way. Maybe you're like me when God stretched me like six or eight inches and you're underweight. Well, the Mayo Clinic says this, the most common eating disorders are anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder, and and then each of those have their own list of health problems. And so I want to answer two questions tonight. Why do we struggle with this? And how should we view our pursuit of physical health in light of Scripture? So why do we struggle with this? Why is this a difficulty for some? And you may say tonight that you don't struggle with it, and and I'm going to point out one thing that you might struggle with related to this, Uh, but people do struggle with this. And maybe your sin isn't the sexual sin or the anger or something like that. Those get preached on all the time. Maybe that's not your sin, but we need to hear it because it's someone's sin. So why do we struggle with this? And then how should we view our pursuit of physical health in light of Scripture? Because you can imagine some ways that we could go really wrong in this, right? You can imagine some ways, I've already pointed out too, that I could could shame someone or in such a knee-jerk reaction to go away from shaming, I could pretend it doesn't matter, which I just read you medical statistics that it matters. And that's not even having to do with what God says about it. So let's go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 1. I'll give you a second to turn there. Genesis chapter 3. We're going to cover two principles, so um, eventually one day, hopefully my life will be less busy and I'll have a book come out on this, uh, but I'm giving you one chapter of this book, and this is what I call the, um, the Adam Principles, so you can write that down if you want, um, the Adam Principles, and so it's things that we can learn from the story of Genesis about the man Adam and what happened, and uh, two real principles that answer these questions about why do we struggle with this and how should we view our pursuit of physical health in light of Scripture? So the Adam principles. Genesis chapter 3, and if everybody would look at verse 1. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. It says this. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the tree eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit in the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. Now, of course, there's been a lot of misrepresentation both by Satan and also by um, Eve here. So him saying, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Of course, that's not what God said. He said a specific uh, two trees. And then 
Eve misrepresented where she said, but about the fruit and the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it. Well, God didn't say that, or at least it's not recorded in Scripture, or you will die. Now, here's where Satan, um, where he turns really the course of human history, where we see the first temptation of mankind. Verse 4, it says, No, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. So, the first recorded lie. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, here's what's an interesting thing is sometimes when Satan lies, he uses some truth with it, right? So if you can think of an insecurity that you've had about yourself or, or something that you've struggled with and, and the enemy's speaking to your mind, speaking to your heart, and, and you see some of the truth in that, and then there's a lie. One of the things I do when I counsel with people is I, I try to drive them toward underlying truths that they can hang their hat on. Like, like there's some things that our heart can get carried away with things, but our minds, if we can just process, process some logical truths and rest our hat on those truths, it can help us. And if we, maybe we have to say them to ourselves, remind them of ourselves and remind our heart because sometimes our heart just gets carried away and, and starts believing the lie, and we have to remember the mind. And so this part, what Satan says is true. He says, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God. Now, of course, they don't become gods, but, but in this sense, their eyes are open, knowing good and evil. This is one of the things that happened at the fall, that, that instead of our, our eyes being darkened, our eyes were opened more. That, that at this time, there was one choice in all of humanity, that, that you can do one thing wrong, that's it. Before this, there's nothing else you can do wrong except for don't eat from that tree. After that, think about how many options you have. How many fruit of the trees you have. I mean, it's infinite. You, you don't even know all the circumstances that you're going to face maybe this week. So he says, in fact, verse 5, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. There's three things there. You hear them. Good for food, delightful to look at, and desirable for obtaining wisdom. There's a, there's a parallel passage in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. I don't have that on your notes. You could write that down if you want. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And it says it this way. It says, Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Lust of the flesh, my body wants it. Lust of the eyes, my eyes see it and want it. Pride of life, there's something about it that will add to my stature, and so therefore I want it. That's what it says here. It was good for food, it would nourish me. It's delightful to look at, my eyes want it, and that's desirable for obtaining wisdom. There's something about that, and it's wisdom in this instance, that will add to my stature. Oh, Satan said it will make me like God. It will add to my stature, and so I want it. All three of these have kind of been seen as like the root of all sin, that, that these three different things are, are the umbrella, the parent of all these different opportunities of sin. And so this was the temptation. And so look what happens. It says, she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. See, he didn't completely lie. Remember that when Satan's talking to you. There, there's, a, there's a truth maybe in that, but there's a lie as well, and the lie is devastating. So she also gave some to her husband, so she compounded her, um, her sin by not just eating it herself, but spread her sin. We do that sometimes as well. Who was with her? And he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So what I want to kind of think about is what happened. What happened here? And the first thing we see is temptation happened. Now, it's uh, interesting. If you ask me for my favorite dessert, I'll answer you first. I don't really care as long as it's not gross and I can have a glass of milk. Like, I just really like milk. I don't know why. Um, and I'm really not that picky about what dessert I have. But if you pressed me on it, I don't know why I really like sugar cookies. Oh, yeah. Like, you could buy them cheap from Walmart and hand me a pack in, like, plastic, and I'd be like, yeah, that's one of my favorite desserts. I don't know why. Interesting thing about me, and this is going to be too, uh, too much information. I apologize. Um, I had a period of time in my life where every time I ate sugar cookies, I threw up. 
What? Now, I'm ashamed to admit, that didn't make me want sugar cookies any less. <laughs> right? Some people it does. Like if, I've heard people say this, like if you threw up something, you'd be like, don't judge me. I heard y'all laughing. <laughs> If you threw up something, it like ruined your appetite for it forever. Anybody ever have that? Yes. Yeah. Sometimes. Not me with sugar cookies. <laughs> like, still like them. I still think they're incredible. Don't know why. I'm telling you, if I went home and Danielle had some, I'd eat them tonight. If I threw up and there were still some tomorrow, I'd try it again and just say, <laughs> maybe there was another denominator that I'm not thinking about. And so, science experiment, kind of. Um, but here's what it is. Like, if we just took away the enjoyment of it, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, if we took away the desirableness of sugar cookies or whatever it is that is your favorite food, if we, if we took that aside and you said, hey, here's this thing, I want you to eat it, it makes you throw up, you'd be like, great sales pitch, like, no thank you, right? You wouldn't want it. And yet, if you really like something, there's that temptation there. I don't want us to miss this, that the first sin in all of human history, the first thing, there's all sorts of factors. There's, there's Satan tempting, there's, there's lying, he's lying, but the first sin of humans occurred with food. Have you ever thought about that? Like as much as we harp on, on sexual sin and, and drugs and um, whatever else it may be and their sins, The first sin recorded by humans, of course, it's disobedience to God, it's pride, it's all those things, but the actual action, the catalyst that made them take the final step was food. It was a temptation toward food. It was Obi sitting there before a sugar cookie saying, man, that may make me throw up, but it's going to taste awesome. Less of the flesh, less of the eyes, pride of life. So what happened at this moment I mean, let's read this again, verse 6. Look at it with me. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. Now, if you pause there, you can observe all of those things and they could be true and you don't have to take another step. Now, here's the lie or or an a lie in our society is that we sometimes feel like if we have any of those, it's good, it's delightful to look at and something about it will increase my stature, make me feel good. We have believed this lie in society that says, therefore, I can't help it. Therefore, man, if all those things are true, I have to take this extra step and say, I have to be gratified then because it it met the criteria, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. It met those, therefore, I have to be gratified. I have to do this, whether it's with food or sex or or, uh, money or an opportunity or, or anger. Someone makes you mad. Man, it just feels right to get revenge, right? We've believed this lie that just because I feel something, I have to do something. We believe this lie sexually, right? I mean, if someone says, let's say, for instance, I'll use an example because it's, it's the one churches talk about more than this, and so I'm going to use it as an example to prove this. Same-sex attraction. I've, I've had a girl in, uh, when I was a youth pastor who I was counseling with her because she was struggling with same-sex attraction. Of course, I treated her with grace and affirmed the, um, affirmed the image of God in her, and she said to me, does God just not want me to be happy? Now, of course, she's believed a lie. She's believed a lie that what is good for food, delightful to look at, and desirable for obtaining wisdom, those are the things that will make you happy, which, of course, they're not. If we have a desire, we feel like I have to act on that desire, otherwise I won't be happy. But if the root of all these sins is a lie from Satan that we'll get temporary satisfaction, we'll get temporary dopamine hits, we'll get those things but no lasting satisfaction. And so if we would say that about other sins, which we do, and we're not wrong about that, what about with food? You see what happened here. She saw this at verse 6. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. And if you stop there, she hasn't sinned. All she did was observe facts. That's it. But the next part of the verse, look at it. So she took some of its fruit, and ate it. And then she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. And in that moment, all of human history changed. 
Everything. Everything that the world was going to have happen, everything changed. Everything changed from a utopia to a, a curse is now on this land forever until God redeems His possession to Himself. Forever until that moment, everything changed. By one bite of food. One bite of food, forever everything changed. That Their eyes were open and now I can mention multitude of sins. I don't just say, hey guys, anybody ever struggle with looking at that fruit on that tree? That's all they... I mean, if they had a little round like Bible studies, like they had their life groups, they sat around, they're like, man, I looked at that fruit the other day too. It looked good. Yeah, it still looked good. It's a good harvest this year. It's, I, don't know what else, I don't know what else they talk about, right? That's what, now you have an infinite amount of sins you could talk about, right? There you go. Because your eyes were open and all the opportunities came. But that's not all that came. Death came with it. And so this idea of um, where he says, certainly you'll die. Yeah, death came that day. From that day on, people die. Because of this moment, people die. This is what happened. It changed the world. Sin and death entered the world through food. And then what else changed? That's what we're going to look at next. And uh, I'm just say this. Sin twisted our relationship with food and with work. And that's really what I'm talking about tonight. When we talk about gluttony and sloth, the two kind of famous but forgotten Bible words, we wonder why do we struggle with this and what does the Bible have to say about it? What happened is sin in this moment changed forever and twisted our relationship with food and with work. So I think I have it on your notes, but if not, it's only one chapter back. Look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. I'm going to have you flip back and forth. So 15, 16, 17 we'll read, but I'm only reading 15 first. We're going to talk about work first. It says, The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. Now, if I ever do uh, premarital counseling for you, um, and I, I talked uh, talk to some today, like Skylar, I was talking to her today about uh, if you ask me to do a wedding, sorry, I like to call people out. If you ask me to do a wedding, then I always wear this watch. This is like a $40 Walmart watch, and it's uh, kind of camo. I wear that in every, watch, uh, every wedding I preach in, and if you don't like that, then I guess uh, I'm not going to be your pastor in it because I wear this watch everywhere. Uh, the exception is if you buy me an Apple Watch Ultra, I'll take it off. But <laughs> otherwise, you're getting this if you want me. All right, anyway. So, so this says... The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work and to watch over it. So if you go through premarital counseling with me, I'll talk about how really the intention in the Garden of Eden was to work. And even if you think about the purpose of man and wife, why are they together? Um, when, when Eve was uh, made, it was because God looked around and said there's no help meet for her. Well, people are like, oh, she's just it, like subservient. That's his helper. And people get mad about that, which, of course, that's not the point. The point was, Adam, go work. Oh, you need someone to help you work. Eve, go work with Adam. Like they're, they're a partnership doing God's work. That's the purpose of it. That's why he paired people together. But that's what they're doing here. So before the fall in chapter 2, you see, he says to the man, he placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. It's an interesting thing to think that even before sin entered the world, there was work. It makes me realize that once we get to eternity, there's still going to be work. We're going to have things to do. Even in utopia, there was work. But it wasn't bad work. Like, how many of y'all ever have, uh, like, just bad day at work? Bad job, right? It's hard to be a programmer with a hurt thumb, right? Yeah. Rough, right? I, I once worked, uh, I worked in a secure facility, a secure room inside a secure room inside a secure facility, which makes it sound cool. It was super boring. Uh, but also it was freezing because it was like a server area. And so I would just have to sit back there sometimes and, and like we'd call in people to do some work on the stuff there that I, I wasn't allowed to help them with it. And so I just have to sit there and watch them, make sure they didn't do anything bad. And it's like 50 something degrees and I'd like just sit there and freeze to death. So that was rough. Uh, that was the only point I had behind that. Um, but if you've ever had a, had a difficult job, difficult working. I, uh, I, I think of mowing. I hate mowing the lawn. Amen. Like I, I just, some people love it. 
Like I've had neighbors that go out there, Olin, you love it. I've had neighbors that go out there and they like mow like crazy. I had this one neighbor lady that mowed three times a week and I just know she was looking at me with daggers in her eyes like your yard is just terrible. And I was just like, and I don't care. Like <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to make it good enough to where like I don't have the HOA called on me. Like that's, that's my goal. That's my standard. And I hate it for one reason because it's boring, but two, I hate it. It is boring. Reese, agree to disagree. It's boring, but also I always buy a cheap lawnmower that's short. And so like, I'm like leaned over the whole time. And by the time, it's only like a 40 minute, no, it's probably not even 40, what is it, Danielle? 20 minutes, 30 minutes, something like that. I, I do it pretty fast. Sometimes I jog when I'm mowing because I think it's so boring. So I'm sure I do it like a terrible choppy job, but it gets it done faster. But by the end of it, my back is killing me from bending over at this like, cheap, short mower that I should have just upgraded, got a little taller one, but I don't because it's cheaper and it's still working. It does blow smoke out right now, but still, that's a different conversation. So I, it still works, and so I still use it. Maybe next time I'll buy a taller one, but probably not because I'll be like, oh, like $479. Yeah, that one. So, but work, some people love their work. But work is a difficult thing, and why? I mean, if you think about what God says here in Genesis 2.15, he made the man, he placed him in the Garden of Eden, work it, watch over it. This is utopia, and there's work. Well, look what happened after the fall. Turn to chapter 3 and look at verse 17. Chapter 3 and verse 17. Chapter 3, verse 17 says this. He said to the man, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. So he's saying, here's, here's the consequence. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it, for you are dust, and you will return to dust. So not only death there predicted, but a difficult life. Not just death, but a difficult life of work. Do you see that moment at the beginning of Genesis chapter 3, what happened when, when they took a bite of the fruit? Forever, our relationship with work was changed. It was changed from something that it was just to glorify God, but I don't think it was very hard. I don't think they got tired. I don't think they got fatigued. I don't think they got bored because they were just designed to do the work of God and, and their eyes weren't even open. They, they only knew there was one bad thing to do. So, so they had a limited understanding, but then their eyes were open and the ground was cursed by Creator God. And so the point one on your paper is this. God's curse made work difficult. God's curse made work difficult. And so that's why we have a problem with laziness. I have on your paper as well, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 15. Laziness induces deep sleep, and a lazy person will go hungry. There's a consequence for it in this world. right? If, if we just sit around and do nothing, there's a consequence. Because no longer do we have the abundance of the Garden of Eden. It's an abundant world still, but you have to work for it. You have to work. That is a consequence of the fall. We already had to work, but now you have to do difficult work. But that's not the only thing that changed. Turn back to Genesis chapter 2 and look at verse 16. Genesis 2.16 says this, And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. You hear what verse 16 says? You are free to eat from any tree of the garden. It's just like, Go have at it. God's smorgasbord for you. It's like you go to Golden Corral, but nothing makes you fat, right? It's like, <laughs> this is, it's just God's smorgasbord out there for you. But if you eat from that one tree, trouble. So then I have on your paper, I have a Proverbs 23, 19 through 21 says, listen, my son, and be wise. Keep your mind on the right course. Don't associate with those who drink too much wine or with those who gorge themselves on meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will become poor, and grogginess will clothe them in. Man, it is a sin to eat too much. It is a sin to have gluttony in our life. Now, 
People, we struggle with all sorts of things. But it is a sin to eat too much. It is a sin to gorge ourselves. It is not a holy act to do these things. What this did when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what this did is it forever perverted our relationship with food and with work. The two things twisted now by a curse that God himself has cursed the ground and we have death reigning through our bodies, it has been cursed. I remember uh, when I was still in that early phase of thinking I was an athlete, I was a young airman, so I'd, I did enough PT to still, I guess, eat like an athlete, although it's starting to catch up with me. And uh, I went to this uh, Chinese restaurant and I ordered, um, I thought it was like one meal with a side dish, but they were like the most ridiculous portions I've ever seen and they brought both of them out there, both meals. So it was like one of them alone, I should have halved it, right? But they gave me two. And so that's really four portions there. And I was sitting there with a bunch of other young airmen, and of course you know what happened. They're like, oh, let's see if you can eat it. So I did. And so I just sat there. It's funny, some of our best friends to this day, that was the first time they ever met me. And so that was a great first impression. Um, so I sat there and ate it. I remember afterward, I felt like I tore my stomach. Like, seriously, I was like, oh, man, like, I've never had that happen before. That actually is the most quantity of food I've ever eaten, and that's my limit. Like, <laughs> any more death. Uh, like, if you, go, <laughs> if you go further than that, you're in trouble. So it is a sin to gorge ourselves. So the next point is God's curse made food complicated. It's not bad. There are already... There are already rules. Think about this. The point is, God's curse made food complicated. There are already rules for food, weren't there? We read it in, in chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. He says, you can eat from any tree, but he has one rule. Don't eat from those trees. Because if you eat from those, you'll die. There is one rule. Now, imagine if you're trying to get fit. you got to track your micronutrients and all those, like... I don't even try to do that. I'm like, Danielle, just cook less carbs for me, please. Like, I want to be around to be a grandfather. Cook less carbs for me. God's curse made food complicated. So we go to food for comfort, for joy, for a dopamine hit to satisfy a craving. Or we avoid food, even to an unhealthy degree, because we're self-conscious about how we look. Like, think about that even. That side of of our struggle with this is sometimes we even try to do the right thing, but we do it for a psychologically wrong reason that we're just like, I'm just worried about how I look and, and we're afraid about how people are perceiving us that they're going to call you fat boy or skinny boy. We eat food, but with no consideration of what types we eat. So the conclusion is this, sin has twisted our relationship with food and work. Allowing ourselves to fall into an unholy relationship with food or with laziness is sin. Like, we got to talk about it like that. we got to talk about it like we talk about all the other sins. And just as I try to say with any other sin that I'm preaching on, and we have to preach on sin because, it's one, it's in Scripture, and two, sin is your enemy. Like, sin wants to end you. Did you hear the opening statistics about what this sin of gluttony will do to us? It's, it's one thing to shame people. Man, stop it, because all sin is the same. All sin is evil. All sin is an offense to a holy God. And thank goodness we have a Redeemer, because we're all sinners, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. Yeah. Every single one of us. So praise God we have a Redeemer. Yeah. So stop, stop making fun of people and things like that. Yes, but also don't act like sin's not deadly. Don't treat it like it's not a thing that wants to kill you because it literally kills people 600,000 in 2020. Leading cause of death, one in five Americans, that's what they die from. We can't act like the sin isn't deadly. It's the sin we don't talk about, but it is a deadly sin. Allowing ourselves into, to fall into an unholy relationship with food or laziness is sin, but pursuing physical health can be an act of discipline and obedience to God, an act of honoring Him with our bodies. That's what I want you to hear from this. What I'm not saying is go, like, get super fit so that you can post better Instagram, like, images of yourself from the perfect angle so that you look buffer than you are, right? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying go try to make people jealous, or I'm not saying, I'm not saying, like, get super fit and show off your body so that instead of, like, a sin with gluttony, you call someone else to have a sin with lust. I'm not saying that. Don't do that. 
What I'm saying is, disciplining yourself to be healthy can be an act of worship. Why? Because if it's sin to fall into these things, and if the struggle is real because the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, if those are real, to say, I see the temptation, but I'm going to abstain for you, God. I'm going to discipline myself for you, God. That's an act of worship. So I have some principles that I'm going to encourage you to take. And I am not a nutritionist. I still would like to eat like an athlete. Uh, but I'm going to give you some. One, I'm going to start with this. Eliminate vanity. We often seek to get fit simply for other people to notice. Instead, seek to please God by taking care of your body. Eliminate vanity. Don't get fit for other people. Instead, seek to please God by taking care of your body. Vanity could be a problem with this. When we say the struggle with, with eating, with work, with any of that, vanity is, is just as much of a sin as these other things I've talked about. Second one, fast. Begin with one meal and dedicate it to prayer and then eat a reasonable portion for that next meal, meaning don't make up for all those lost calories like, oh, I fasted and now I'm going to eat this humongous meal afterward. So instead, help break that addiction that we sometimes have with food by fasting. Like it's a really interesting spiritual discipline that God gave us in Scripture that we could fast and pray and say, God, I deprive even my body for a time to worship you. Now do it in a healthy way. Don't try to go five days without food. I'm not saying that. If you go on any extreme fasting, do so with the, the help of a medical doctor, right? Do that kind of thing. Because what I'm not saying here is be extreme, become ascetics, which if you don't know what that means, it's like people deprive themselves for religious purposes. That's not Christ-like. In fact, Colossians, the book of Colossians, talks against asceticism. That's not Christ-like. This isn't saying how to get skinny and how to get um, fit and buff. Or anything. That's not what I'm saying. It's how to get get healthy. I want you to be healthy. So begin with fasting. Have a healthy caloric intake. If you're going to um, lose weight, then eat reasonably less calories than your body needs. I said reasonably. Eat healthy. Seek help if you have an eating disorder. Don't, um, don't seek drastic and unhealthy measures. Don't see that as honoring God. If you take just drastic, unhealthy measures, that doesn't honor God. You're destroying your body, the temple, in a different way. Get active in some capacity. If you can, exercise in a well-rounded fashion, things like cardio for your heart, weights to build muscle to support your body, burn fat, things like that. Uh, when I was doing my doctoral work, I did a, a heavy section on neuroscience, and uh, when they study the brains of people in their 80s, what's interesting is there's two factors that can keep a mind very lucid well into their 80s. They don't have as many studies of people in their 90s, but well into their 80s, um, it can keep them quite lucid. And one, it's if you have a very complex job, like you have, have to do an extreme amount of decision-making, critical thinking, that can keep you lucid. It's not people who like think doing word puzzles, that's going to keep you lucid. You're going to be really good at word puzzles, but that doesn't cause... Uh, that doesn't um, make you have a lot of lateral thinking. That's one. The other is exercise. Like people don't think about the, the effects even of your mind, on your mind of exercise. Now I say slow, uh, slow down, start slow. Don't overwork your body one day, uh, on one day or one week. Like don't just say, I say this like when I'm telling people how to read the Bible, don't say like, I'm going to read 50 chapters today. Like, okay, and then you'll never read again probably. Like, that's too much. If you're like, I'm going to go and I'm going to do like 10 sets of like all the hardest exercise. Okay, tomorrow you won't be able to walk. So like, like start slow. Break into it slow. Be consistent. Take some steps for physical exercise. So be consistent to the next one. Just like spiritual disciplines, do something even when you don't feel like doing everything. That's the thing we struggle with. It's like, unless I can have the best workout ever, then I'm not going to do anything. Drink plenty of water. Sleep. Get regular sleep. Man, young adults, I'm telling you, <laughs> you're going to feel it in your 30s that you don't sleep. Take care of your body. Sleep is super important. Cut something out of your life if you are too busy to take care of your health. So those are just some tips I have. Again, I'm not a nutritionist, not a medical doctor. The question is why? 
Why do all that? Why take those steps? Maybe you're, you've heard this tonight and you're like, man, this is kind of weird to have a, a preacher preaching on dietary things. It kind of is unusual. I agree with you there, but it's not weird because it's in Scripture. Because gluttony and sloth are two of the least talked about sins that are out there. Because misuse of food caused sin and death to come to humanity. You ever think about that? Misuse of food caused sin and death to come to humanity. And destroying our body with food or laziness is sin. i got some verses on your paper there. Look at Ephesians 5, verse 15. It says, Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Scripture tells us to be cautious. Now look at the next one, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 6. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought at a price, so glorify God with your body. Now, that section has to do with sexual immorality, but even before that, it talks about meat for the belly and the belly for meats, but God will destroy both. So it's not out of context to, to reference this to taking care of our body. I want you to know this truth. God cares about your body. He's the author of it. He is the one who knit you together in your mother's womb. And this thing that we sometimes just recklessly destroy, whether it's through lack of sleep, what we drink, what we eat, not doing anything to to be physical, to stay active, that can limit our effectiveness in the kingdom. That can limit the number of years we have here on earth to serve God here. Did you hear the first statistic that all mortality is impacted by this? From Genesis 3, all mortality was impacted by this. To this day, all mortality is impacted by this. So I want to ask you to make some decisions. I have five decisions that I want you to make. I'm going to go through them quickly. See your physical health. I'm, I'm, I'm challenging you to decide this. To see your physical health as an act of worshiping God. See your physical health as an act of worshiping God. Number two, take steps of discipline to improve your health as a desire for holiness in your life. Number three, turn from narcissism, realizing your image is in Christ, not your physique. Number four, seek health, because your body's a temple, and you want to use your health to serve him until he calls you home. And when he calls you home, let it be for reasons outside of your control. Decide that you won't be called home prematurely because you failed to take care of your body. And number five is this, give yourself grace. Because that's a hard sermon, I know it is. Talking about any sin that that God wants us to clean up in our life, it's always hard. Give yourself grace because God has. God extends grace to each of us. And from those very chapters, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we see the fall of man because of eating this food, but we also see God's plan of redemption where he says, "By, by, uh, by the Son of Man will crushed the head of the serpent. God had a plan all the way from then to have the cross, to offer Jesus Christ as a sacrifice in your place for any of the sins, all the sins, including gluttony and sloth. What I'm telling you tonight is this, that some of us struggle with this and some of us don't. But if you don't struggle with this, you struggle with something else. But just because this hasn't been talked about as as much doesn't mean it's not significant doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. doesn't mean that God doesn't care about your body. There are real-world consequences to indulging in this sin and real-world consequences that could take us out of the field for God or take us off the earth early. Those have eternal consequences because if you name the name of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you are here to serve Him. And sometimes by not showing discipline and allowing ourselves to become unhealthy, we're less useful for God. And God wants you to serve Him. Do it for Him. Take steps toward health for Him. I didn't say go get ripped or go get super skinny. I didn't say that. I said go be healthy 
for him. Let's pray. Father God, as we come before you and I, I offer these decisions before these people, my heart is this. I don't, I, I don't want to attack anybody anytime I speak on sin because you're a God of grace. But God, some of us struggle with this and we've perhaps believed a lie that it's, it's okay to not, not resist it. Because sometimes when we say we struggle with things, we don't actually struggle that hard. In fact, maybe we've accepted it in our life. And this is sin just as much as a man who cheats on his wife, just as much as a man who commits murder, just as much as any of the sin, they're all an offense before you. And to prove it, it's the first sin we committed as humanity. God, it's a sin. So what I pray for everyone here tonight is they would seek healthiness. That we would not mock people, cut down people, make fun of people. None of that, God. That's, that's evil too. But what we would do is see this as part of our discipleship. That when we say you're Lord of our life, that means every bit of us, including our bodies. When we say that you're Lord of our life, that doesn't mean that I'll get, get rid of the things that that society or cultural Christianity has said, those are the sins to get rid of. It means all of it's yours, God. And so maybe there's someone here tonight who they've been okay with it. Or they, maybe they're not okay because they've felt some of the ramifications like mental health is on that list. It's a sin that can, can make us feel inferior about ourselves. And even tonight, that's one of my greatest fears is that someone tonight is sitting there saying, yeah, there's just another person getting after me because I'm heavy. That's not what I want, God. Not at all. Because just like every other sin I talk about, godly guilt is not meant to weigh us down, but it's meant to evoke change. And God, you call us to live a healthy life for you. You call us to discipline ourselves. You call us to live holy and acceptable to you. This is not a question about our identity because our identity is in Christ. This is a question of our obedience. I pray for obedience for everyone in this room, including me. I confess this before a room tonight because I've confessed it to you many a times, God. This is the sin I most struggle with. And just like all sin, I hate it. But sometimes the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they get to us. So in those moments, God, I am grateful for grace. And so someone who feels beat up right now by it, let them feel your grace. And let this obedience not come from a place of, of feeling beat down, pushed down. Let it come from a place of truth that they see this is indeed sin against the holy God. And then let it come from a place of love that they say, because I love God, because he first loved me, I want to be obedient with my life and therefore my body. I pray that. And maybe there's someone here tonight who has never trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They don't know the God who created them, who spoke them into existence. God, I pray that they would not leave here tonight without giving their life to you, that they would come and talk to me or a leader, and we could show them how to be saved. We give you all praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.